Now, let's talk about a story that we broke on this very show yesterday and the backlash to the government's decision not to scrap thousands of EU laws by the end of the year. Kemi Badenoch has tried to take the heat off Rishi Sunak by saying that it was her decision. Uh, but here's what I'm asking today. Are civil servants actually to blame for this government U-turn? For what it's worth, the head of the civil service union has been urging people not to call them woke and not to call them snowflakes and not to try to insinuate that they're work shy at all. But if you really break it down, as our deputy political editor Tom Harwood did for us this time yesterday, in order for them to have worked through this backlog of around 4,800 EU laws and get them shifted and burn them, basically. Uh, it would have equated to around 18 a day for that department, which I think many people might think is not the greatest task in the world. I'm joined now by Conservative MP and GB News presenter Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, have we been let down here, or Brexiteers been let down here, by the civil service not doing their job and helping to light a bonfire of EU rules and regs? Oh, yes, I think we have. And I, I think um, Cone Bennock put a very brave face on the failure of the civil service. If I remember rightly, it's against the ministerial code to blame the civil service, so she couldn't really have laid into them. Um, but when I was at the business department, I was told that to deal with about 350 EU regulations, we would need 300 more civil servants working full-time for a year. I thought this was nonsense and said I could probably do them myself over a weekend. So I think, yes, snowflakey, work-shy civil servants probably belonging to your friends who you're quoting earlier as union. OK, all, all right. And uh, what would you have liked to have seen them do? Is it just a case of work harder? Or are there actually intricacies that you're maybe deliberately missing here, which are about getting a load of EU laws biffed and then us replacing them with our own? Well, there is the um, EU directive on the marketing of green bananas. There are things like that that shouldn't take an enormous amount of time to deal with. There are others that are more complicated, that's certainly true. So there is work to be done, but this work should have been going on for some time. And every time an EU law came in, departments had to work through them then so that they knew what they were supposed to do and they presented a package to Parliament, the European Scrutiny Committee. So the work on what the regulations mean was done in some cases years ago. It's now looking through and saying, is that rule really necessary? Is that the right approach to regulation? Can we deregulate? Because the other story you've been running today is on the rise in interest rates. Mm. And one of the ways to tackle inflation is to make production cheaper, to lower the costs and increase the competitiveness of the economy. And that's done by cutting regulation, the so-called supply side reforms. And it would really help ease the pain from higher interest rates if we got on with deregulation and deregulation of EU laws. Jacob, why have we not become Singapore on sea, on Thames? Well, um, I was speaking to a friend of mine last week who lives in Singapore, and he was saying to me uh, that as it's about 80 degrees plus every day in Singapore and it rains every day, we're perhaps quite lucky not at least have the climate of Singapore. Mm. Um, why haven't we had more ambition to deliver the fruits of Brexit? Mm. I think partly the pandemic got in the way and then we changed leader and Boris Johnson uh, was a great believer in this. He really wanted to push it forward and Rishi is less excited by uh, the benefits of Brexit. It's not that he's against Brexit, but it's not what um, motivates him. But is this not an act of national self-sabotage or a deliberate stunting of our opportunity for growth and to take full advantage of our uh, you know, sovereign nature uh, as a country now. I mean, this would just appear to be a deliberate act of national self-harm. Well, it's an anti-growth policy. And also, most frustratingly, uh, it, it is um, against a very specific promise Rishi Sunak himself gave, that there's that little video clip his um, leadership campaign made saying that they were going to put EU laws through the shredder. And they've mm. now put the promise through the shredder instead. And I think that's um, unfortunate well, and a mistake. J Jacob, why is it that the only solution to growth in this country appears to be mass immigration? Well, that isn't an answer to growth anyway. If you look at immigration, uh, it may increase GDP, but it doesn't necessarily increase GDP per capita. 
because a lot of the jobs people come in to do are relatively lowly paid. Mm. So you don't get a genuine increase in economic growth from mass immigration, and certainly that hasn't been our recent experience. No, exactly. And just when it comes to the impact that this will have on the morale of Brexiteers, I can't help but wonder whether or not we are living through and have lived through pretty much since the moment that these Brexit votes were cast, a, a, a deliberate behind-the-scenes attempt to do whatever could possibly be done to nullify any benefits of Brexit, potentially, with a view to us one day either rejoining the European Union or potentially just not really de-aligning ourselves from it. Is that what we're seeing? Well, In I think view. you hit the nail on the head. Um, I... Uh, behind me, you can see the House of Lords, probably, and the Lords will be a leaping because the Romaniac Lords have always wanted to keep us in close alignment with the European Union. Not that I think they expect to be able to rejoin, but so that we don't diverge and make the most of our opportunities. Not getting rid of retained EU law means we will not diverge, we will be shadowing the European Union, we will be close to the European Union, we will be as inefficient as the European Union. It is therefore a missed opportunity, a failure, and the people who are rejoicing today are the people like Peter Mandelson, the people who are really, really strongly pro the EU.